Good morning uh, or good afternoon. I'll present a guidance note for including persons with disabilities in water sector operations. Uh, it was developed specifically for water and sanitation specialists at the World Bank, but also for those who uh, would like to design operations that are more inclusive. Um, let me just mention that it was written by Deepti Samant Raja uh, under the guidance of Charlotte McLean and Lapo, who is the Global D um, Disability Advisor at the World Bank, and uh, in very close collaboration with Louisa Gosling from the Water Aid. So, some may ask, why does it matter? You may hear, in my community, we really do not have persons with disabilities. Um, However, there are a few, a few key figures worth mentioning. First, more than 1 billion persons worldwide uh, live with some form of disability, and 80% of uh, disabled people live in developing countries. Not only that, but this number is expected to rise um, due to uh, factors such as um, you know, the, percentage of, uh, the percentage increase in aging population, war and conflict, and the impacts of climate change. Um, finally, it matters for development because persons with disabilities consistently fare less well than their non-disabled peers. They generally have poorer health, lower education achievements, uh, lower employment levels, and higher rates of poverty than persons without disabilities. Now, the guidance note um, contains a lot of background information, so I will not go into details. But since it was published last year, a few more updates um, can be shared today. Uh, so at the Global Disability Summit this past summer, uh, the World Bank has announced 10 commitments on disability. Um, and it has published a disability inclusion and accountability framework, and also very recently a good practice note on disability which accompanies the new environmental and social framework. Then within the water sector, um, uh, the Global Water Security and Sanitation Partnership, um, in inclusion is a standalone a priority theme. And we also have an uh, inclusion in water program, which uh, aims to deepen this agenda. So now, how does disability inclusive development matter in rural context? Um, so some of uh, the, the guidance note lists four impacts uh, or consequences produced by lack of access to water resources among persons with disabilities. So uh, these include um, a social impact of dependency. So when persons with disabilities are dependent on others to access safe water uh, or sanitation, they are at greater risk uh, of sexual and finan financial exploitation, for example then economic impacts on households. Households with persons with disabilities often have to pay additionally out of pocket um, for expenses related to structural, structural uh, modification um, or, uh, you know, uh, very, there, there are various ad additional costs associated with uh, changing the design. Um, economic and educational participation. So lack of access to wash impacts um, school attendance, for example, uh, or job opportunities. And then finally, there are risks uh, of secondary health conditions and disabilities, um, since poor wash can lead to serious health conditions and infections. Um, and then we know that early exposure to poor wash can also increase, increase the risk of developing uh, disabilities later on. Disability inclusive development matters for rural water and sanitation because of the barriers that persons with disabilities face in accessing uh, wash services. And uh, these barriers include um, distance to water points, so long distances are a challenge and navigation may be difficult for persons with visual disabilities. Um, design of water points and sanitation facilities, so lack of ramp access, high steps, nothing to hold on to. So on the left, you can see examples of inaccessible infrastructure. There are broken uneven steps, high platform, lack of space inside, uh, or narrow entrance. And persons with disabilities may face difficulty in turning different types of taps. So um, other also challenges include carrying and transporting water and difficulties accessing water at home. 
there are also safety concerns caused, for example, by slippery surfaces and broken steps. So I'll just add that it's worth noting that making infrastructure accessible benefits not only the disabled, but also other groups, such as the elderly, women with small children, or people with temporal injuries. So it really benefits everyone. So what can we do? Uh, there are different actions we can take for disability inclusion. First, we can consider a twin track approach, which means mainstreaming and targeting. So mainstreaming disability into consultations, needs assessments, infrastructure development and services, but also uh, undertaking targeted disability specific activities. And um, then um, using the social model of disability, that means thinking beyond disability as a medical condition, considering social and institutional issues that lead to exclusion. And then law and policy. So it's important uh, to have in place laws and policies that address the needs of disabled people. And uh, involving persons with disabilities. Here, persons with disabilities uh, often remain invisible their voices and concerns are not heard because they are not invited to the table. Um, we can take steps to ensure participation in public uh, consultations. We can engage DPOs, disability experts as partners and consultants. Finally, disability data and needs analysis. Uh, here we can consider disaggregation and adding specific questions in ongoing surveys. Um, also, it's recommended to use gradual scales of functional difficulties rather than yes or no question. So, for example, um, WASH poverty diagnostic conducted in Tajikistan found that 55% of surveyed households had at least one household member facing some level of difficulty with core functional domains. And this number uh, would, would have probably been much lower if the question was formulated as a yes or no question. So another um, approach uh, to consider is building capacity of decision makers and stakeholders. It may involve training practitioners, engineers, architects, um, then monitoring and evaluation. So using specific uh, indicators for disability and disaggregating results. Um, and there are some sample indicators included in the guidance note. Um, making information accessible, uh, it's, about being, it's about being aware that um, there are communication barriers, for example, not being able to see, hear, or touch. So we can try to provide information in multiple formats, so using text, audio, SMS, uh, or video. And then finally, designing accessible physical infrastructure. That's um, it's important because uh, accessibility from the start uh, keeps additional costs minimal. Um, so we can apply uh, accessible design standards and use universal design practices. So here is an example of the National Rural Water Supply and Sanitation Project uh, in Indonesia, Pamsimas. It's a large scale operation. It operates in 70% of the total districts and municipalities in Indonesia. The project aims to improve access to water supply and sanitation services in 27,000 villages by year 2020. And it has already provided benefits to over 10 million people. Uh, in 2016, PAMSIMAS provided a master training to 55 stakeholders at the national and provincial levels uh, on disability inclusive development. And then uh, afterwards, uh, it, its approach was to mainstream the training for 4,000 facilitators, and also it piloted universal design in 50 villages in 2017. On this slide, you can see an example of accessible design uh, and from PAMSIMAS project. So it's a toilet for disabled uh, on the left side of the picture and a standard toilet on the right. So this and other useful resources uh, are included in the guidance note. Then another example is a, um, in Ethiopia, the WASH program, which targets both urban and rural WASH. It's scaled up disability inclusion by addressing specific needs of persons with disabilities. And actions included uh, conducting stakeholder consultations that included 
persons with disabilities and developing and adopting standard design guidelines for uh, sanitation facilities in schools and health facilities. And then as it enters the, its second phase, it intends to add a few activities. Um, for example, it plans to establish mechanisms for increasing affordability of wash uh, for the most vulnerable, and those will include persons with disability. So to conclude, of all actions that the guidance note and other resources offer, I would like to highlight three. So the importance of accessibility and safety audit uh, to see um, to see the facilities and surrounding environment and identify necessary adjustments needed, involving DPOs in design and implementation. So if you do a safety audit, it's definitely a good idea to involve, um, to work together with uh, disabled uh, people's organizations in doing so. And finally, collecting disaggregated data, though it may seem to be costly, it can actually benefit um, the project and show its impact. And baseline data is helpful to understand current levels of accessibility uh, and how it can put, uh, benefit uh, beneficiaries with disabilities. Here is a list of resources and if you are looking for additional information uh, we will be happy to share it with you. Uh, please do feel free to contact me or my colleague Ayumi Koyama if you do have any additional questions. Thank you so much.